for those of us that haven't met before, my name is Ant Bird, and I head up the construction sector at BSI, the British Standards Institution. I've got a 45-minute session today to take you through a bit of a standards update as to what is happening. It's classed as a standards briefing, and it's talking about evaluating the current and future benefits of construction standards. But really, in a bit more detail, what I want to get into is to talk about the role of standards, what they are, and probably more correctly at times, what they're not, and the value of standards and how they're utilized to bring about trade and ultimately to bring about innovation, a bit of a springboard effect for what is our largest industry, the construction industry. As I say, it's sort of broken down into two sections today, so I'll talk about the role of standards, etc. And then I'm very mindful that we have a number of architects and specifiers and clients here today. I want to give a bit of an update on what's happening in the world of construction standards. So I want to touch upon BIM, because I can't not, not talk, touch upon BIM. Structural Eurocodes, a bit about fire safety. Uh, the construction products regulations, which is very pertinent to, to products uh, within the EU. Sustainability, and then a bit on flooding as well. And then I just want to finish with about how you can get better involved with standardization in terms of maybe offering your own comments on what we produce, um, or ultimately getting involved as a committee member. A little bit about BSI, the British Standards Institution first. First and foremost, yes, we are a leading global standards creation body, and therefore we produce British standards, but also we work upon European standards, international standards, and public and private standards as well. We are your national standards body. That is, you know, under World Trade Organization rules, every country needs a national standards body, and we are that for, 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 for the UK, and therefore we are the hosts, in effect, of British standards. We also have a specialist focus on standards creation, of course we would, but also training and certification as well. And on that basis, we have a global network of some considerable size. We have some 70,000 clients around the world. We operate in 150 countries, and we support governments, not just the UK government, global brands, and of course our all-important SMEs too, the largest part of our business. Yep, we're experienced, there's no doubt about it. We were the world's first national standards body and we were established back in 1901. And we are a founding member of ISO, so from an international perspective. We're perceived and thought to be thought leaders, having shaped with our committees and our members some of the most adopted standards in the world, including ISO 9001, a standard that will be up for review very shortly and actually a new version towards the end of this year. And we're trusted. We're a Royal Charter company, that means we're akin to the BBC, I'm not sure if that's a good thing or not. Uh, but we do make profit, and we do reinvest them back into our business. And that's very important, because I have to stand before you and say we are not part of the civil service. I formerly was a civil servant for 16 years of my life, running the national building regulations for England and Wales. But we are not the civil service. We are very fortunate we get some of your money to spend on actually sending our committee members around the world to attend European and international committees but we are not the civil service, so we do make profit, but we reinvest back in to improve our clients' experience. Let's go back to basics. If we're going to think about the value and the role of standards, we do have to go back, really, for us to the start. What you have there before you is a picture of the port of Antwerp in 1903. And why is this important? This was important because this was the busiest trading port in the world at that time. And what you see before you are people coming off the boats with items to trade and sell. We went with the advent of basically mass production and electricity, we went from cottage and craft industries to trade and cross-border trade. And that's very pertinent to us. 1903 was, of course, the first year that we produced the British Standard, BS1. And there it is. BS1 was everything to do with rolled steel joists. Okay? It was a construction specification. Uh, BS2 was steel tram tracks, which at the time in the UK, we had 76 designs thereof. By virtue of BS2, we went down to seven. And again, it was all about bringing about interoperability and actually providing a platform, a springboard, to rationalize and actually think about how we could do things better. And that's what we're doing today. There's a lot of sort of uh, black magic spoken about what are standards, what do they do, what do they don't do. But it's all about providing a springboard for trade and to actually talk the same language, interoperability. So we have about 100 years' experience in shaping global standards to facilitate trade and improve business. I think it's still safe to say that even now, in 2015, 
From a construction perspective, the vast majority of the standards we write are, in effect, product standards. The construction industry is such that it is dominated by that. And, you know, but as are other parts of the business, they are very important to what we do. We also have process standards there, and I've already touched upon ISO 9001. Information security, as an example, and environmental management. Not really something we have directly in construction per se. We tend to have something akin to this known as codes of good practice, and they are very popular within our, our standards portfolio. But we're also seeing now migration as well and the importance of organisational potential standards. So we're thinking about anti-bribery, corporate social responsibility, collaborative business relationships, very important areas for business at large, whether they work in construction or not, they're very horizontal standards. So what we're really seeing is something akin to the picture I have before you. There's a Renault engine block. I think it's, fa it's fair to say that virtually every product that makes up that engine has a standard, British, European or international. The hands working on the actual engine don't. And that's an area we're looking at in terms of improving levels of performance and assurance to clients and their needs. I also have to be very honest and very clear about separating out the difference between standards and regulations. So from the point of view of a British standard, they are typically, there are some exceptions, but I'll touch upon that uh, over the course of this session, they are typically voluntary. Okay? They are market-led, they are state-of-art. They are subject to full stakeholder engagement, so they get, we go out for public uh, consultation, typically for a two-month period as a minimum. They are written by experts, the experts in our all-important committee, uh, committees that we host. And they are maintained and reviewed. So typically a British standard will be reviewed on a five yearly cycle. So they are updated um, and actually are cognizant of what is happening else within the construction marketplace. So that's a standard. From a regulatory perspective, typically these are minimum legal requirements. So be mindful where we are today, be mindful what I do under construction, be mindful what I used to do in my previous role. An example of regulations would be the building regulations. And we have a set in England, we have a set in Scotland, and we have a set in Northern Ireland and Wales too. They are secondary legislation regulations. Now, I have to make it quite clear from a standards perspective, quite often standards are utilised to show compliance with regulations. What happens is, typically, if we take England as an example, we have things called approved documents, which I'm sure many of you will be aware of, and they will convey status on a standard. They will cite them in guidance, of some sort, such as the approved documents. Where that happens, yes, they're one way of showing compliance, but they are not the only way. They still allow innovation, they still allow alternatives, but it's very important to understand the separation between what is a standard and what is a regulation. From a global perspective, when we think about BSI, in terms of the national standards body, and I work for the national standards body, and I have to be very honest and open and transparent here, we are the people that do standards, we have another side of our business, the certification and insurance side of our business, the kite mark part of the business, but we have a very clear line of demarcation between the two businesses. So for the national standards body in which I work, we have about 300 staff. We have some, just around now, 15,000 subscribing members of BSI, and we have around 11,000 all-important committee members. These are the men and women that populate our committees and help us develop right standards at both a European uh, a national, European and international perspective. At any one time, we have about 1,200 technical uh, committees or subcommittees and about 7,000 live projects. We ho host around 190 international and European secretariats. So an example within my team is that we look after TC250, which looks after the structural Eurocodes at a European level. But the criticality for me is perhaps this figure, international and European standards work. In fact, I think this is a little low now. About 95% of what we do is for working within Europe and internationally at ISO. So about 5% of what we do is national-based. Such is the marketplace of construction and standards, okay? So there's a lot of discussions at the moment about the importance of Europe. Well, it's things like that that tends to set our focus. So, when we talk about standards, what do we include? What do they relate to? What you've got before you here is a pyramid 
setting out the different types of standards. It is not hierarchical. I'll make that quite clear, OK? No one is better than the other. They just all have a role to play. At the bottom, in the yellow area, is not a space I occupy, per se, from, from, from my position. But the sorts of things you have here are professional codes, guidance, and best practice. So the likes of the RIBA, RICS, from one of my institutions, as an example, they produce their own codes and standards. You then have corporate technical specifications, OK? And that could be developed in-house for seven years of my life. I was a building surveyor for the Metropolitan Police, then part of the Crown Estate. They had their own technical specifications that sat over and above building regulations and were quite separate from what was being undertaken in standardization. An example also being De Beers, the diamond people, have their own specifications and standards. And then we have private and consortia standards. Again, very important and a role to play in, in our marketplace. But the red area is really the space that we, BSI, occupy on your behalf. So we have something called PASIS, publicly available specifications, and these are sponsored standards. OK, we have to make that quite clear. They are faster to market, typically 12 months, and they have a different status from a national standard that you're probably more aware of. PASIS have proved very popular where we want to move quickly with clients, and therefore much of the work we've undertaken on BIM, building information modeling, has been through the PAS route. We then have our, our beloved national standards, and from a construction perspective, we have around 6,000 construction standards in our portfolio. And then we have the regions. So we've got European standards that sit in our portfolio. And of course, we have ISO, International Organization of Standardization, for truly international standards. And again, oh, and again, BIM sits there, BIM sits there very clearly. I think that one point to make quite clear is the ability for us to escalate our standards to suit best the construction industry in the UK. So we can take a publicly available specification, as we've done on BIM, and we have put it straight into ISO as a work item. And that is now, actually, it's 1192 part two, uh, part of BIM, where we're going to look to turn that into an ISO standard. Because there are things that we deal with in construction which are truly international, and BIM is an example of that. Yes, from a construction perspective, we are heavily regulated from a national and a European perspective. So things like the construction products regulations will sit tightly at a European level. But we have the ability to move PASIs and British standards either into SEN or to ISO. And that's really useful for us. And it's useful for UK too, because it allows a springboard again where people have got national expertise or they're producing products. And then they are befitting of the European or international marketplace as well. And if we're talking about sort of construction and where we want to go to with Construction 2025, we want to export our expertise as well, our consultants, our architects, our engineers. And if the world is using our standards or standards predicated on our original content, that's got to be a good place to be. So when we talk about our construction sector, um, I don't hold back at work talking about this. You are very, very important. We are still the UK's largest industry. We're worth about 8% of the UK economy. Uh, typically around, our latest figures are about 107 billion pounds a year construction is worth to the UK. And it employs 3 million people. So it's a very important place to be. And very important place for government too. Interestingly, the 100 billion, about 40 billion of this, I'm mindful of where I'm stood today, 40 billion of this relates to products. Again, such as the size and the importance of what you specify and what you buy, OK, on behalf of clients or clients by, for those of you that are clients. Why do we use standards? Well, just as I say, from our perspective, it's a benchmarking. They are statements of best practice. And therefore, when you have benchmarking, it's agreed across industry. We've already spoken about interoperability, and that's very important too. And they are a communications shortcut. If you thought you had to specify every time what good looks like for a fire alarm system, a piece of gypsum board, a ducting system, or for fire safety, that's the point of a standard. It seems very simplistic, but it's very important. They are tools to support regulation. I've already mentioned that. And therefore, they are a potential shortcut to compliance. And they are, on the whole, voluntary. And therefore, less regulation. I think it's fair to say I've I served the last two administrations before coming to this role some 18 months ago. And maybe uh, the, uh, the Labour administration called it better regulation. Coalition government were very clear it was deregulation. We are now waiting to see where the current incumbent 
uh, government decides where to go. But I think it's fair to say what they have mooted is that they're looking for £10 billion worth of further savings in terms of re reducing regulatory costs. So taking regulations away, and therefore standards can be a very good way for clients to specify what they would like, or architects and specifiers to say, this is what the client will be wanting, this is what we need to maintain quality, even if there isn't regulatory in provision in place to support that. Again, standards, why are they important? They do enable trade across borders. A big area for us, of course, is the construction products regulations, looking to remove technical barrier to trade across Europe with construction products and the application of CE marking. And a really important one for me is that they encourage innovation, and this is key because they form an agreed basis, an agreed platform from which to build off of. Okay, we're not rediscovering the wheel every time. There's a line in the sand. This is what good looks like, actually. This is state of art. Let's build from that. And so just going into a bit more detail, when we have state of the art standards, which we produce uh, at BSI with our committee's help, they're all about accessing best practice. Yes, some people will want to do less. Um, it might not be a regulated area, but there are many that want to do the best possible, and that's important for us. It's, of course, for the very horizontal standards, and I've mentioned sort of good business practice, etc. There are ways in which you can improve your organizational processes, so ISO 9001, but then getting into the detail of what I do in construction with my team, developing codes, guidance, and standards. It increases confidence in the research outputs, so quite a lot of, of research that comes forward will be formalized through a standardization route. And that's very useful, too, to then allow us to move it around the international marketplace. It can be used to inform the supply chain. Again, mindful where we are, very important it is, too. And it accelerates route to market. It makes markets. Parochial to what we do back in Chiswick, which is the home of the National Standards Body of BSI, it allows experts to come together and make contact and talk through issues. There is much discussed through our committees, but there is much discussed in the margins, too, about business and where we need to go further. And of course, achieving first mover advantage, that is very important for our marketplace. And when you look at what we've achieved in many areas, including building information modeling, which I'll touch upon in a minute, the UK is seen as, as at the vanguard of how we are moving forward. So let's put value of standards into context, because that was in my title, and it's quite important. There's two snippets here for you. The first is a quote. Standardization contributes around two and a half billion to the UK economy, okay? And that's a quote from a HMG, Her Majesty's Government document, 10 years ago. We have new figures on that, but they're being launched in the next couple of weeks at a parliamentary event, so I can't tell you what they are. But I can tell you very clearly, it further shows the importance of standardization to the UK marketplace. The second quote there from an AFNOR, which is the French equivalent of BSI, suggests that nearly 70% of companies believe standardization contributes to the generation of profit and has a positive impact on a company's value. Again, very important. I'm standing before you talking about construction, but I could be here just as readily talking about manufacturing, governance and risk, or even broader sustainability, all areas of which we focus our attention at BSI. That's standards. That's what they are. That's what they're not. That's why we believe they are important and we can't do them without you. For the last part of this session, I just want to give you a bit of an update as to what's happening in the world of standardization that you might have a professional interest in terms of moving forward from today. So when we talk about the built environment, what does the standards landscape look like? Well, when I think about my day job and working with my team, that's roughly it. It's about 6,000 standards. I'd like to thin them out, and we're going through the process of doing some of that. But we have some additional items too, codes of good practice, books, etc. But if you work around here, it's quite interesting. At about 1, 2 o'clock, we've got the all-important building information modeling. And I'm sounding like a broken record. But I'll take you through that in a moment, because I've got a few dedicated slides. But there's also something you've probably been reading about in your relevant journals too. Now, while it doesn't sit within my part of the business, it sits within manufacturing and wider business, there's something called smart cities. There is a massive international interest in how we move forward with designing smart cities. And what is interesting is that I suggest to you there will be a, a convergence of building information modeling and smart cities as we move over the coming years. I'll be honest with you, BIM is very important, um, 
but it will become the norm. It's still very high profile, it still gets singled out, but it will become a, norm a normative part of the construction industry. But smart cities is coming too, and straight through the middle of this will be geospatial data as well. It will be smart, city, uh, smart, smart, smart citizens working with the information we have for our buildings, both whilst building and maintaining, and the operation of our cities and towns. And that's going to be a huge area. Structural Euro codes, I'll talk about those in a moment because they're very relevant. Sustainable construction, a very big area, but bizarrely not heavily regulated from a construction perspective. And I'll explain what I mean by that. A lot of that is driven by forward-looking uh, product manufacturers and forward-looking clients as to what they would like. Construction products, working very closely, a big part of what we do. Infrastructure, so that could be road building, bridges, etc. Um, when you look at you know, uh, the figures, construction is enjoying um, some growth and not before time. What is interesting, where an awful lot of the money is going internationally and nationally, it's infrastructure, it's high speed too, it's Crossrail, it's Thames Tidal, and that's a very big area for us. Similarly, fire safety, a huge and very important part of what we do. Energy performance in buildings. And for me, I suppose coming into this role, in addition to BIM, a very big area, and I think it needs a lot more work, is asset and facilities management. If you think the money that can be saved through building a building utilizing BIM is big, it'll be dwarfed by asset management. We're currently spending about 110 billion pounds a year on FM but I think there are other things that we can achieve there, so we will be looking at that. But moving into BIM, um, it's entitled An Alternative Approach, because I spoke earlier about the last government, the coalition government, also wanting to deregulate. And a lot is actually said about BIM in terms of it being regulated. That is not the intention, or that was not the intention of the last administration. When we talk about BIM, coming into place level two from 2016, we're talking about a condition of contract. So quite simply, if you want access to the government's 9-0 checkbook for public works, from 2016, the last government said you need to be BIM level two, okay? It's a condition of contract. You don't want to play the game? Don't play the game. However, in the 26 years I've worked construction, I've never seen our industry mobilize around BIM uh, or around an issue such as BIM ever like this before because of the good news story that comes with it. There's a picture of Francis Maud, former Minister of State to the Cabinet Office, no longer there, but laudable, the words, basically wanting the UK to be at the vanguard of building information modelling, because of what it could bring for us nationally in terms of savings, but what it could bring to us also internationally for selling expertise and consultancy more generally. So what is BIM? I've got to put my hands up. I'm not a BIM expert. I'm a Chartered Building Surveyor and Fire Engineer by background. But a lot is said, a lot is quoted, but for me, very simplistically, BIM is the right information at the right time to the right people in the right form, something my industry should have done 70 years ago. Now, a lot is actually said, and there's a picture of Crossrail there at Tottenham Court Road, that it's all about 3D modelling. No, OK? We have the computing power to 3D model and to 3D model well, and I'm probably talking to the converted anyway. But it is a multidimensional digital tool, but what's really important for me, it is a visual model, but it's managing asset data. This is all about data. It's hanging data off of the model, okay? And that's key. And it's all about design from inception to demolition. It's the life of the building, and that's important too. Another big word that comes with BIM level two for me is collaborative. Yeah, collaborative 3D model, but it's about the creation, the gathering, and the exchange of data to all parties. Don't be scared. There's an awful lot of fluff written around BIM, I'll be honest with you, and it is very important, and some of it is very technical, but don't be scared off by it. You might have seen this before. This is the BIM maturity uh, model, the wedge as we call it. Uh, we have Mr. Mark Bew and Mervyn Richards to thank for this, but it basically takes us from where we start. If I, if I remember when I was a district surveyor and then working Crown Estate, we were over here. We were on drawing boards. Well, I was on drawing boards for some of my time. Then we went to computer-aided design, and I remember the software arriving, and I remember the plotters arriving, and I remember moving design onto, onto CAD. And we then printed it off, and then we folded it up, put it in the post, and sent it, which was always novel. But of course, here we are. There'll be many people saying they're doing BIM level four, five, and six, which is quite interesting. But this is where we are at the moment. Level one, we have 2D and 3D representation. 
We have better interoperability, better collaboration, but we're trying to get here. And as I say, what we want is the ability for an architect and his or her design team to do their work, and then the structural engineer and their team to do their work, and then the mechanical electrical engineer to do the work, but to populate the same model and actually utilize and manipulate the relevant data. And that's very important. OK, there's Nirvana, BIM level three. That's for another, that's for another day. But if you are interested in I'm reading about BIM level three, the previous government produced a document, uh, Digital Built Britain. And that talks about the convergence of BIM, geospatial data, and smart cities, if you're interested. But this is the space we're operating in. So information is at the center of BIM. No ifs or buts. It's about sharing information through collaboration and underpinned by technology. We tried to do this a number of years ago. As I say, for 16 years, I was head of technical policy at DCLG, where I oversaw the English and Welsh building regulations. And I had people out in Singapore working with the Singapore Building Code people and standards talking about this some 10 years ago. But we didn't have the IT capability to hang this, to make this work. We're there now. But again, it's not new. You still need intelligent input. So all this, 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 this choice words that will be doing away with professionals, we still need intelligent input. The way I look upon BIM, if it's utilized correctly, not only will you get the right product at the end, i.e. the building, but actually we should allow our professionals to spend more time on the right areas where they need to focus their attention, and that's very important. So yeah, you populate the model, you can draw off specifications, you can undertake building analysis, you'll still need production details on site, Big area for me, I've had many a fight on site, verbal, clash detection. Nothing like trying to get back and put intumescent products on a beam that, dare I say, the mechanical vent boys have just run a duck so close to. Um, you know, schedules, you can take them off. Really important for the paying client. Yes, the 3D visualization is first rate. The walkthrough capability is amazing. And that's very tangible, because very often the people that are signing these 6 0 checks are clients that don't come from a world of construction. And you still have your all important 2D drawings. So again, very useful. So that's the construction phase. So we're talking about better information. We're talking about better design decisions, really important. You can help de-risk, such as you know, looking for clash sort of uh, detection. And I talk here about build off-site. I know we've got some off-site people here. I don't mean in terms of building off-site. You are building the 3D model. It's easier to, to actually uh, interpret, look at, etc. Hopefully, at the, at the end of it, you should have a better asset. Because by hanging all the information off and it being suitably shared, you should, have always been, you should be getting what you've always thought you were getting. And that's something that doesn't happen very often in UK construction, in my experience. So I think that is really useful too. What we're talking about for CapEx, for the build cost savings, in the order of 20%. And that's from government work. And that's sizable. Why was that appealing to the last administration? I think it's appealing because that means one in five new schools would be free to them spending your money. And that makes most people set up. And I think that figure is what makes clients sit up now, whether they're interested or not in actually going down public works. But what about operational phase? Well, for me, a really important aspect, undertaken poorly so often, is it should lead to better effective handover of the building. It should therefore lead to reduced operating costs and carbon emissions. Honesty moment, many clients are interested in carbon reduction, not because of carbon reduction. They want operating cost reductions. That's laudable too, wouldn't we all? This can help achieve that. I think by handing over the correct information to the FM manager or the client, ultimately you'll see reduced maintenance costs because they'll know what they got. They know how it needs to be maintained. They know where to get replacement product from. And it will lead to better asset. So I think it's win-win. So much so, we're talking about OPEX costs here, which will dwarf the CAPEX. So, but to be honest with you, the new lingo in town is TOTEX. How much can I save in the building and running of, of projects and buildings thereafter? Which appeals to government, because government tends to keep its buildings. And so do many blue chip clients. So, very simply, and then we'll move away from BIM. This is basically a diagram of what amounts to level two. BIM, okay, from 2016. I need to make it quite clear, this government has not referred to BIM directly yet. They're obviously having discussions with their officials. We have a new business secretary. We'll need to see what he says about how we move forward on BIM. But from our perspective, if you run around from about three o'clock down, the Construction Industry Council have got a fantastic document that talks about the BIM protocol and the use of BIM. It's freely available. Go and have a look at it. 
Innovate UK, I'm very mindful of where I'm stood to right now, um, have sponsored some fantastic pieces of work, including digitizing the digital plan of works, the REBA plan of works, and classifications associated. Everything else, all the way around, is our content. British standards or publicly available specifications. Go and have a look at our website. They've all been paid for by Biz. They are all free to download. So take some time, have a look. If you wanted my honest opinion what to look at, there's a cracking document also on our website produced by the Construction Products Association called BIM for the Terrified. If you're a complete newbie to BIM, download it, have a read of it. If you want to understand BIM a bit more, I'd have a look at the operational phase part two and then dip out in and out of the others. A very important piece for us is cybersecurity coming up because of course we're talking about asset data here and that's going to run. So that's BIM. Right, what else do you need to be aware of before I, I, I die from serious man flu up here? I want to touch upon structural euro codes. We've got an event tomorrow where we're talking about this in a bit more detail tomorrow morning. So if you're interested in that, come to our stand 25 and have a chat with colleagues there. But the structural euro codes, again, was all about removing technical barriers to trade. I used to look after approved document A, structural design for England and Wales. But the euro codes was trying to deal with, well, can't we have a European language for structural design? And way back, 40-odd years ago, that's what we attempted to do. It came into fruition. I'm not going to get into the details. But what happened is, in March 2010, finally we had a complete suite of structural Euro codes which were utilised across Europe. They're cited in our approved documents for building regs purposes in England. They are two for Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales, or I think Northern Ireland just about to formalise. And they are one way of showing compliance. It is a far better place to be. But you need to be aware, similar to national standards, Euro codes are up for a review too, okay? Five yearly cycle, but they're, they're being reviewed in a very, very useful way. What I'll draw your attention to here is that it is my team on behalf of UK that provides the secretariat to send TC250 that oversee this Euro code work. And we're also very important, the chairman of send TC250 um, is a UK senior, very senior consultant. Uh, based at Parsons Brinkerhoff, Steve Denton, uh, an eminent, uh, eminent uh, individual. What are they trying to achieve? Well, for those of you that have a structural engineering bias, well, we're looking for some new structural Euro codes on the use of structural glass, not uncommon from where we're stood right now, reinforced polymers and membrane structures. But the key thing for me is further harmonization and ease of use, trying to reduce national determined parameters, because we have these Euro codes, 58 of them, but we have 52 documents that set about what are the UK parameters. So we're trying to rationalize those. So watch this space. In the meantime, generation one Euro codes, we've got a couple of amendments coming up. For those of you, as I say, involved in structural design, you want to be aware that over the coming months, we've got a couple more documents coming out. So keep an eye on the BSI website, please. Other things I want to talk to you in the short time we've got available, um, a few high profile fire standards, something very close to my heart, because I used to be the UK fire regulator. Big things I draw out for you there, BS, the middle one, BS 9999, fire safety in the design, management and use of residential buildings. This document has already been out for public consultation. It is now closed. It closed last week and we're now considering the comments. So a very important document that has been widely adopted in the UK marketplace to show compliance with fire safety design for meeting national building regulations. A focus this time on sheltered accommodation and vulnerable persons, so that's much welcomed. And by the same token, a biggie for us, BS 9999. Everything other than residential and domestic. This is the code of practice for fire safety in the design, management and use of buildings. Okay, a very important document, heavily utilised both for new and existing buildings in terms of what good it looks like in terms of fire safety design. The panel that we call it are currently working on that document, that should be out next year for consultation. We would welcome people's views. Such is the power of that document, I know for a fact that the, the Italian government have already started to use that in part to meet Italian fire standards. Again, utilising our expertise, I would gladly like to know that we've got consultants, UK consultants getting on planes going to Italy to assist with such things. So watch this space. Um, mindful of where I am, so in the last couple of minutes I want to talk about the construction products regulations. Again, akin to structural Euro codes, all about removing technical barriers to trade. Wouldn't it be great if we have a construction product, we'll say a fire door, that actually if we had a standard in place, all of Europe had to utilise it, 
subject to requisite performance in testing terms and capability, you could then pick up that product and move it all around the marketplace, including Germany, which can be uh, quite a difficult at times marketplace to get into. That was the intention of the construction products regulations, or more correctly, the construction products directive originally. We now have the CPR, because we now have a regulation across Europe. It's all about clarifying when and what C marking is mandatory. We have some 430 harmonized product standards, including doors, windows, structural steel, aluminium, etc. And that allows a C marking to go on the product, hopefully, therefore, to allow it to move around the European Union. The intention was to improve in cred credibility. The intention as well, although it's not been utilized, is to strengthen sustainability requirements for products. Okay? The Commission have not moved on this. They are still considering where we might go. And while we're talking about sustainability, I just want to touch upon a couple of areas. We have something called CEN TC350, which looks at the sustainability of construction works. So I'm still amazed at the amount of money that's spent on papers and, and thoughts about what good sustainability looks like. Much has been undertaken at a European level on this already. And we have the ability in BSEN 15804 to assess construction works now. And what that gives guidance on is how you might wish, because they're voluntary, to undertake environment product declarations for different types of products. So what does good look like? Okay, client-driven or manufacturer-driven, and there's some very clear guidance there. It's voluntary. By the same token, we have guidance on calculation methods for whole buildings, what it might look like, and the three pillars for sustainable development are social, environmental, and economy, and we have standards for those too. But I think what's clear to say is that the Commission at European level are not clear on what they may or may not do in terms of regulating under the construction products regulations. What they have shown an interest in is something called the circular economy, and they're looking at this now. Traditional business, for what we have done in the past, is very linear. So taking us through, we take some raw materials, we extract them, we make something, distribute it and use it, and ultimately, we dispose it. Okay, very linear. What we're looking for in the future is to make it more circular, with the smaller the circles being the less impact. So, yeah, okay, if we want to take a room, extra, extract raw material, we've got a recovery, recover and recycle. We might want to think a bit better about refurbishing and remanufacturing, okay? We might want to reuse and redistribute. Okay, it might not have come to the end of its life, but somebody else might want to use it thereafter. And then we've got this bizarre thing called maintain or repair, which is also pretty fundamental if we think about sustainability. So the Commission are looking at this now. Um, they've invited stakeholders to participate in taking this forward. Bottom line is they're thinking about how they might move forward with a framework in relation to the circular economy at a European level. Whether they regulate for that or not, we do not know, but you just need to be aware it's happening. Finally, those of you that get involved in design um, for flood resilient construction, um, we have a new standard hopefully out later this year to provide further, better, more up to date advice on improving the flood performance of new buildings. Building regulations do not legislate for flood performance. If you decide to build in a flood zone, that is your decision with your client, or if you're the client, that's your decision. So, with that in mind, this document will hopefully allow you to design better. This is a perfect example of good standardization. Regulations aren't making you do it. Your insurer might, but more likely, the client will want to do something like this. So watch this space. Right, finally, just a couple of things. I'm mindful of the audience I'm speaking to today. We couldn't do what we do without our fantastic committee members. They undertake an awful lot of their time and their employer's time to help us develop standards. But by the same token, we need comments from you. All I'd say is, if, you're, if you get wind, you see one of our flyers about standards that are coming through, if you're interested in commenting upon one, we would truly value that. Go into Google, type in BSI DPC, and I promise you it will bring up this home page here. This is the page you can go in and have a look at and see what's happening and what's out for consultation at BSI. There's an example, there's a screenshot. Currently, at the time I took this, 24 documents are out for consultation. If you click into that, sign up to it, you can look at the draft documents and you can offer your comments. Our documents are only as good as the people that comment upon them, so I know you're busy professionals, but if there's something of interest, we would truly like to hear from you. And by the same token, last couple of slides, 
if you want to get involved in standardization, if you've got an idea for a standard, speaking with a client, or if you are a client, or you have ideas if you undertake international work, don't hesitate to approach us. Tell us your thoughts. Give me a ring. It's not a problem. Happy to talk. By the same token, we're always on the lookout for committee members, OK? All important committee members. We undertake training um, and allow networking. Um, come and join BSI if you're of interest in that. We have some 100 committees that sit under my portfolio and they're meeting busily most often. That, ladies and gentlemen, mindful of the time, is my session for today. I hope you found it useful. And thank you for coming to join me and not going over to see Paul Morell. Thank you very much indeed.